Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to me to be here today. Um, I want to explain to you uh, the objectives of the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate and the reason why we organize these commissions and some parts of the report we presented last September to the Secretary General of the United Nations. So first, let me go quickly. We know the facts. Climate change is real. Um, extreme weather events are happening almost every day. Yes, a very fast sequence. You remember the uh, typhoon in Philippines who killed 6,000 people. 6,000 people, I can say that quickly, but it is incredible that such kind of things are happening. And in January, we had the extreme winter in the United States. And at the same time, the same year, in other part of the country, we had the worst drought ever in California, um, almost 200 years. And the reason for 200 years is because there are no records before that, but this, the worst uh, drought ever. And then we had, at the same time in China, we had the worst drought in 50 years in very important parts. A million or 100 million people suffered a lot due to this drought. And just to finish with Mexico, we had the hurricane uh, Odile who destroyed a very important part of the infrastructure in the beautiful city of Los Cabos in our country. So climate change is a fact. And scientists are, demonstrated, are demonstrating what are the scientific reasons for climate change. Just going quickly to the IPCC report, we can see that the global temperature is increasing clearly. You can see in this uh, graph uh, global temperature by decades. And you can see the last three decades have been the hottest decades in uh, more than 1,000 years in the North Hemisphere, uh, in, uh, one of the hottest ever, and one is hotter than the previous one. So temperature is growing, exactly as science was predicting. And that implies, for instance, uh, the sea level, the, the temperature in the sea level is growing as well. And that implies that the sea level has increased in the last century. So those are the facts. And the point is, at the same time, we have a terrible economic crisis. We have problems in Europe. Actually, again, Greece is emerging like an alarm in the next years due to political issues. But the point is, uh, Europe is suffering, and somebody is talking about the three, triple deep uh, economic crisis. Brazil uh, fell in a recession last year. Uh, Japan is not growing despite the very expansionary monetary policy, the avionomics, and India is uh, suffering in 2012 and 13 uh, the worst economic performance in more than a decade, and China is growing still, but uh, the rate decreased. So we need two problems at the same time, the economy and the environment. So some countries, in, among them, uh, Norway, Sweden, the UK, Korea, Indonesia, Colombia, and Ethiopia, ask us, uh, some people, to try to respond to this question. How can we combine economic growth, which is in the mind of any leader in the world, or businessman, or businesswoman, how can we combine responsibility with the environment, and at the same time, to promote economic growth? And actually, the basic question is, is that possible? Um, it is crucial to answer this because, in our opinion, the most important obstacle to take responsibility, to take action on that, is that the general perception is that tackling climate change implies huge economic cost, implies a terrible sacrifice to the people, and no one rationally would say, well, I will put a lot of economic costs on my people in order to be responsible with next generation. It's very difficult to take such kind of decisions. So we organized the commission and quickly uh, to say that uh, there are seven commissioning countries. I already mentioned them. 
We have an economic advisory panel, who, which is led by Professor Lord Nicholas Stern, the author of the very famous Stern Report. And uh, Professor, Professor Stern, or Nick, as we call him, organized a quite important and impressive team uh, formed by several of the most important economists in the world, including two Nobel Prize winners, like Danny Cunningham and Michael Spence. And we have the support of almost 100 of the most important institutions, among them the World Resources Institute, and I want to express my gratitude uh, to the World Bank and the World Resources Institute for this invitation. So the Global Commission uh, is chaired by Nick Stern and myself, and we have former head of states like uh, President Lagos from Chile or Jens Stoltenberg, former Prime Minister of Norway, and by the way, currently Secretary General of NATO. I told Jens Stoltenberg, well, okay, Jens, you can go to do that as long as you can fix this situation with Ukraine and all those things. Uh, we have people coming from private sector. We have Paul Polman from Unilever, for instance, or Chad Holiday, who was the chairman of the Bank of America. Uh, and we have people for the most important international agencies. We have people uh, from uh, IMF, of the World Bank, and uh, we have people from the uh, International Energy Agency and uh, uh, several institutions. So what is the idea of the Global Commissions on the Economy and Climate? The basic question we ask is exactly as I mentioned, which is, it is possible. It is possible to combine. It is possible to tackle climate change and at the same time to promote economic growth. And the answer we have is yes, it is possible to have better growth and a better climate at the same time. Yes, it is possible to create jobs and at the same time to be responsible with the environment, but we need to take decisions and we need to take decisions right now. And we see that the next 15 years are a window of opportunity and probably the last window we have in order to do both things, which implies to design a new economic model that could produce economic growth and at the same time could tackle climate change. So what are the secrets? What are the, the key conclusions of the report we presented? We say that there are like three big systems that we need to change. And that is the reasons why we are talking today with you. The first system we need to change is energy. And here, the basic idea is a very old one, which is we are not saying that we need to cancel economic opportunities. And we are not saying that we need to decouple economic growth from the use of energy. What we are saying is we need to decouple economic growth from carbon emission. And that is absolutely possible and crucial in order to take better climate, by the way, better growth. The second system that we need to change is land use. And the basic idea is we need to stop the emissions coming from the land use. Basically, you know that the emissions coming from land use are around 20 or 25 percent of the total carbon emission a year which implies uh, that uh, we need to stop deforestation and degradation of the soil. And the land use implies a quite important challenge, which is related with feeding the people. So we need to provide probably 70% more calories that we, than we produce today in the next 20 years in order to feed more people and in a better way. And we need to do that using the same or even less surface. So in that sense, we need some kind of revolution, a, a new green revolutions or double green revolutions, a green revolutions in order to produce more food in the same surfaces, but at the same time, a production of food protecting and preserving the environment. And the third system is exactly your 
issue, which is cities. We need to change the way in which we are organizing the cities because the current model of sprawling cities, more focus of individual cars, it's impossible to continue in the future. We are estimating that in the next 15 years, more than one billion people are going to come to live in cities on addition or on top of the people we already live there. What, mean, what does it mean one billion people more in cities in the next 15 years? That implies that we need to build a city like this, Washington DC, every single month during the next 15 years. One city like Washington every single month or one city like Stockholm, around a little bit more than one million people every single week, which is impossible to afford. So those are the systems we need to change. And we say it is possible to change them. And at the same time, it is possible to get economic growth. Some people say even more economic growth. I don't want to say that. We need to be very prudent, but the fact is, we can have roughly the same economic growth in terms of rate, but I would say definitely better economic growth, much better quality and much better economic growth. And what are the, the points that could allow us to get that kind of economic growth? I would say the first one, there are, there are like a three or there are several drivers of economic growth that, are, that we can promote with the measure we are recommending. One is resource efficiency. We in the countries and governments are talking a lot about how to increase the efficiency and productivity of the economy and the factors of the economy. We talk a lot about how to increase the efficiency and productivity of the capital. And we are promoting labor reforms in order to promote the efficiency and productivity of the labor forces. But the point is, we need to redesign and put the right economic incentives in order to increase the natural resources efficiency, which is crucial. And it is evident that, for instance, in countries or regions in, in which we are subsidizing natural resources like water, the rate of productivity in the agricultural sector is by far lower than anywhere. So the lack of the right price the, the lack of the right e economic incentives to natural resources is damaging and hurting the economic performance. So we can increase, as long as we need to increase capital and labor efficiency, we can and we need to increase natural resources efficiency. And that will be the first factor of, economic, of the new economic growth. The second is infrastructure investment. I will go deeper in this, but the basic idea is like this. We estimate that one way or another, even following the current and grown model of economic growth, or the, the, the current model, I cannot say economic growth, by the way, okay. Even following the current model, we need to spend roughly $90 trillion in the next 15 years in these three systems, energy, land use, and cities. Well. If we need to invest such amount of money, we can invest roughly the same, maybe four, maybe three trillion dollars of difference. We can invest the same in a new model with low carbon emission. So if we are going to spend 90 trillion dollars one way or another, let's do the right way. So we can, and we need to change the investment today in order to promote and get the same economic growth with better quality but with low carbon emissions. And third, innovation. If we establish the right economic incentives in order to promote innovation, we can foster the economic growth. Do the innovation is the key issue since the man discovered the fire. Innovation has been the key issue for economic growth. And we am very sure that that will get that would give us better economic growth. So let me go, qui go quickly. I, uh, behind the idea of energies today, we have an incredible opportunity 
to change the system. And just one factor, the cost of renewable energy is dropping rapidly. Five years ago, even myself, oh, no, 10 years ago, even myself, I was very skeptical about, for instance, solar panels. But today, solar panels are 80% cheaper than they were eight years ago, 80%. And if you see this graph, either in wind energy and solar energy, if we foster research and development, if we put the right economic incentives, very soon renewable energy will be as efficient and competitive than fossil fuels. Actually, in several parts of the country currently today, in places like Chile or even in Austin, Texas, the paradise of natural gas, for instance, renewable energy is becoming as or even more competitive than traditional fossil fuels in energy. So we can switch to low carbon economy in energy. I'm talking about energy in cities only thinking in the sources in which we are applying a lot of energy, like uh, in the design of the buildings, all the aspects related with insulations, all the aspects related with lighting and heating and cooling. In Mexico, we promote a program in order to replace the appliances, basically refrigerators. And we uh, provided a subsidy for the poorest families and a technological and assisted way in order to change the refrigerators. And with that, well, the, the name of the program was really boring at the beginning. It's like a, a saving energy program uh, by changing appliances in domestic purposes or whatever. So we changed the name. And let me say to you, we in Mexico, the wives, uh, you call us the husband like mi viejo or my old one. You know? So the name of the program was Cambia tu viejo por uno nuevo. Change your old one for a new one. <laughs> so the program was very successful. Some ladies were very disappointed about what the program was really. But anyway, we changed uh, almost two million refrigerators and uh, air conditioning equipment in three years. That is possible and we save energy and we save money for the people. On the transport sector, efficient vehicles, uh, cleaner fuels, and of course, and mainly public transportation means, or in waste management, and very big, et cetera, et cetera. And it is possible. They are in our report, and you can console that, I will skip, but there are several examples in which you can not only save energy and carbon emission, but also you can save a lot of money. And you can see the examples of the payback in terms of time on any of these measures. So land use, I will skip this part in order to save time, but basically, we need to, uh, only talking about urban development, urban development is a factor of pressure of the land use, and we need to redesign that. Uh, the less and the pressure, we need better land to, least, to, lessen, to, to reduce the pressure, we need better land and better land use systems. It is possible to change. You can see this beautiful uh, image of the uh, plateau in, the lowest plateau in China in which it is possible to switch the use of land and to recover even degraded soils. Well, let's go to cities. The idea here is to have or to follow the three C principles, compact, connected, and coordinated cities. Compact, connected, and coordinated. Roughly, this model in which we are designing our cities is unaffordable. We cannot continue these sprawling models of cities. If we consider the cost associated with this model, sprawl cost, you can see in this graph, uh, in the left, external costs, for instance, air pollution, congestions, noise, all the, uh, we, we need to estimate what is the price, what is the value of the, all those hours we are losing today, every day, uh, just uh, transporting to, to work? Uh, the cost of increase, the cost of public services, the cost of accidents, even the crash cost, 
the cost of uh, infrastructure capital and so on, we are estimating more than 400 billion per annum only in the United States. 400 billion per annum in the United States with this model of cities. And that is without consider additional 340 and 24 billion a year in the private expenditures of the people. So the cost of this expansionary land use for cities uh, needs to change dramatically in order to get our goals. Uh, Pierre was talking about the cost of traffic congestions in China, for instance. You can see this uh, model, the cost of traffic congestions as percentage of GDP in selected cities. You can see Beijing in the left, and you can see Mexico City, more, more than 2.5% of the GDP a year. That is the cost, only the traffic congestions. <laughs> and even worse, we are considering that uh, millions of people, more than 4 million people are dying uh, prematurely a year do air pollution. Yes, some of that is related with domestic air pollution, but other is related with air pollution in the cities. Basically in China, if we estimate, for instance, the cost, the economic value of premature deaths, premature deaths due air pollution, in China, the cost of that is almost 12% of GDP, 12%. In other words, China, regardless, which is actually more important, which is human life, and we need to talk about that, but only talking about economic side, China loses more economic growth or more economic value than the year economic growth China has. So we need to change this model. Actually, no one of the 50 cities in terms of the population meet the, the air quality standard, even New York City, of course, it's, uh, he, it is below, that is right, it's in the left. But most of the cities are beyond the air quality standards of the city. So, so well-planned, well -planned, compact cities are more efficient in economic terms and have lower emissions. You can see this graph, and you can see in, in the horizontal axis is the urban density in persons per hectare. So Hong Kong by far, by far is the more dense uh, urban area. In the left side, on um, the vertical axis, you can see the gasoline use per capita. Of course, you can see a model with a very compact city like Hong Kong, with a lot of density and very low use of gasoline. And in the left side, I would say the American model and you can see this like Houston or Phoenix or Detroit or Denver, in which you have very low density and quite important use of gasoline per capita. And that is exactly the things we need to change. We can live with human people without emitting an incredible amount of carbon emission every day. Oh, look this beautiful uh, and very famous uh, contrast. You have two cities. One is Atlanta, which is deployed in 4,280 square kilometers, and the other is Barcelona, which uh, uh, occupies only 162 square kilometers. Cities with the same size of population are roughly 5.2 million people. However, people in Barcelona or people in Atlanta are emitting and polluting 10 times than the people in Barcelona. Barcelona only 0.7 tons uh, per person, and in Atlanta, more than seven tons per person. So that's basically the idea. Compact, connected, and coordinated cities is the answer to the future. Either we can use this model of sprawling cities, and this is a, an ugly image and very painful to me, which is the old design of Mexico City, just expanding and expanding and expanding in an affordable way. Or we can pick the density and I would say the human behavior of the cities. Other points, where are the key issues? It's very difficult to change a city like this. It's a real challenge and I would say the uh, uh, dear mayor of Mexico City. But it is possible to do that with new cities. Of course, we can modify any single city to the right incentives. 
Look at this. In the report, we are splitting, we are dividing different types of cities. I, I don't go into the details in order to save time, but basically emerging cities, population between one to 10 millions, and income per capita between two, 2,000 and 20,000 uh, dollars, small urban areas uh, with less than half a million people, mature cities with more than 20,000 income per capita, only 144, and the global mega cities like Mexico City or Rio de Janeiro, New York or London, more than 10 million people and uh, more than $2,000 per capita. So the point is this, you can see the key issue, for instance, we can do anything, we can do a lot of things in any kind of city, but basically the emerging cities between one and 10 million people and between 2,000 and 20,000 income per capita are gonna be the cities that we get the economic growth in the next years and will produce more emission than other one. So the designs of these kind of cities, growing cities, especially in the developing world, is the key issue in order to change today the public policy and public measures. Is it possible to decouple economic growth and uh, carbon emission? Yes, and absolutely yes. That is the case, Copenhagen, for instance. Copenhagen has registered a uh, positive economic growth, and at the same time, a permanent reduction of carbon emission per capita. And the same is with a lot of cities of Norway and Sweden. Uh, more cities are taking uh, measures of smart transportation means, from metro to bus rapid transit, to car-free zones, to car sharing. Actually, there are more models related with smart transportation, we can discuss the issue related with individual cars, but the point is using the web uh, like uh, Uber or other means of transportation uh, are improving or increasing efficiency in, in these ways. But the point is we can apply a lot of measures related in order to have better connected, coordinated and compact cities. Finally, the argument related with investment in infrastructure. The low carbon scenario and the big scenario. The base calculus we are, we need to spend like $90 trillion. If we add a set of measures, we will see that at the end, we will, we need to have, if we choose the right way, which is low carbon economy development, the low carbon economy, we need to increase like four, per, four trillion out of 90, our initial expenditure. However, if you include at the end the operational costs, which are cheaper, for instance, with renewable energy, and other issues, at the end, actually, at net present value, we need to invest even less money in the better performance economy and low carbon economy than in the current inertial traditional economy. In other words, we can get jobs and we can get economic growth investing less and getting better climate. That's the main message. So the Global Commission made 10 set of recommendations. One of them, the number seven is, move to work connected and compact cities. And inside that, uh, we believe the advantages of that is greater productivity and growth coming from agglomerations, reduce infrastructure capital requirements, cost saving in the transport sector, health benefits, which is quite important uh, from improved air quality, uh, multiple co-benefits related with traffic, jobs, congestions, energy security, and so on, and of course, lower carbon economies. And the recommendation to the sector, and I will end with this, first is better urbanization. We need to make better plan urban development like a central element for national strategies. Second, fiscal autonomy, we need, it's not exactly, no one rule applies for anyone, but the point is, if we can pr provide more fiscal autonomy and more local decision, maybe we can improve uh, uh, the smart urban infrastructure. We need to price externalities, that is crucial. Actually, with these reductions of the price of oil and gasoline, it is the right time to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. We are paying last year more than 600 billion in fossil fuels. Six, so we are paying for polluting. We need to phase out fossil fuels exactly now, especially when the price of oil is going down. 
Uh, and actually, it's the right time to establish a carbon tax. It's going to be easier. Actually, uh, that, this is the moment. We need to redirect investment. If you need to choose between uh, public work in order to promote individual car or massive transportation, you need to choose massive transportation means. Planning and governance is crucial. And finally, we need to redesign finance and models in order to create the better future. So the message, my friends, is we can build a better growth, a better world. We can get the economic growth we are looking for, and at the same time, we can tackle climate change. It is possible, but it demands courage and leadership. And it implies to redesign the cities to the future. That is possible, and that is the reason every day more people is working really hard in order to save the planet. So thank you very much, and whatever you want to ask, if we have time, I'm in your order. Thank you. Many, many thanks to you, President Calderon, for those very inspiring words. You started out talking about a politician's dilemma in a time of slow growth. He knows there's a good case for all of this, but he's saying to himself, look, how can I tell my taxpayers I need to do this, um, even if it means investing for the next generation and the ones beyond? How do you get this case out there? You told us we have 15 years. How do we get from here to realizing your vision? Well, one thing is, in my opinion, most of the leaders or businessmen don't know the economic benefits of tackling climate change in the right way. Actually, for all of us, being responsible with the environment implies huge economic cost, as I say. So for the personal vision of a president or prime minister or congressman saying, well, how can I promote sacrifices among my constituents? So that is like a, a mission impossible. But the point is, if we demonstrate, if we discuss, if we talk about that there is a way in which there will be economic benefits, that would be completely different. For instance, here in the United States, one of the points is workers in the coal industry are a main issue, yes. But we need to say that the, the workers in the renewable sector is much more the number of the workers in the coal sector. And actually, the new jobs are coming from renewable sector, not from coal. So we can generate even more jobs in this economy than in the older model. It's like uh, we have passed several years talking about climate change, but we have been talking about the hell of the disaster and the catastrophe in the future, the apocalypse of climate change, yes. And that is true. But now it's time to talk about the, the promised land of responsibility. And the promised land is, yes, we can have better, better planet, and at the same time, we can have economic growth. All those presidents thinking about how can we uh, reboom the economy? Well, this is a way to do that. You need to promote innovation. We need to promote new and different infrastructure expenditures, and you can foster the economic growth. Now, if we focus on cities, our topic here at the Forum, of course, you've made, again, a strong case for compact, coordinated, connected cities. What is the first crucial step that needs to be taken to get us there? Well, it could be planning, definitely. Actually, we are not considering the urban development uh, as a crucial issue. When you make a development plan or economic plan, you are thinking in in public finances, we, you are thinking in uh, some economic incentive, you are thinking in the world trade. It's time to think in a very strategic and privileged position in urban development, uh, how to coordinate with local authorities or the other way around with federal authorities in our case. And probably the second will be the budget. Again, this very simple. If you can choose between a new elevated highway or, or whatever, or a BRT system. Definitely, you need to choose for public means of transportation, definitely. So governments have a chance to choose the budget and priorities, and we need to decouple the, the budget from this oriented towards use of individual cars in the cities. 
We're going to be picking up on those points, not only in our plenaries uh, here at the forum, but also in our parallel sessions. Uh, you talked about the role of megacities in emerging economies. Many people believe they will allow those countries and those regions to leapfrog in development. Would you say that's true? Well, in terms of, uh, of the megacities, it's more complicated because it is more difficult to change a city like Mexico City. But the, the point is, you can change the city anyway. You can establish the right economic incentives and the right public policies. But my point is, Developing countries could leapfrog in the sense that we can bypass the mistakes already done for developed economies. For instance, in the energy system, how can we provide electricity for sub-Saharan African countries, for instance? Well, maybe we don't need to establish this massive investment in uh, transmission lines. Maybe we can foster the generation or generating electricity and renewable sources at local basis with mini grids and so on. So we can look look the examples of mobile phones. We always say that establishing direct lines of direct uh, phone in any single house was a sign of development. And suddenly mobile phone and internet changed these equations and you can reach access for everyone through mobile phones without direct lines. So countries like India, for instance, they bypass the idea of direct lines in mobile, because any mobile phone implies the connectivity for that family. So in the energy, for instance, and Uber development, maybe we can learn from the experiences of already developed countries. And those developing countries could leapfrog in order to reach another stage of development without suffering the mistakes of development of the, of the already developed. What is the next step for the Global Commission, and how will your work now feed into the COP uh, process as it, as it leads up to Paris? Well, we need to talk everywhere about the conclusions of the report. Uh, we would like to debate about uh, this issue with the, the other side. No, I don't want to say the dark side of the... <laughs> but it, the point is, uh, we, we, I want to debate that. Actually, we have not seen the enemy not yet, but, uh, but we, we, want to, we want to debate. We're going to talk about economic growth. So, and of course, as long we can change the perception and public opinion about the sacrifice, the economic sacrifice, we can move faster the level of ambitions and the decisions of, uh, of policymakers. I think we've uh, made a very good start here. As far as I know, we do have time for a couple of audience questions. Um, who would like to pose a question? Raise your hand, please, uh, if you'd like to do so. And we need to get a microphone to you. Do we, um, actually, there's some out here. Do you mind coming to one of these? And do tell us who you are. Good morning, Angela Paris, Technical University of Madrid. A very short question from my side. How do you put equity within your vision? Equity meaning the disparities between cities and the disparities between those living in cities, because this, this seem to be increasing. But actually, this model, this sprawling model, is exactly promoting inequality. Because a model oriented to, for instance, developing countries, at least half of the population, half of the families, have not any vehicle. And this model is promoting inequality as long taxpayers, or all the people, are paying to the privilege of the people who already has a vehicle a car. So this model, this current model, is promoting excluding social exclusion. In order to revert that, for instance, if you privilege massive transportation means, if you create a BRT system, for instance, you are promoting inclusions and equality. Well, this, thank you, it's another argument in favor of our model. The new model promote inclusion, social inclusion, and the, mo the new model uh, promote uh, equality and fix all these uh, factors of social exclusion coming from the current model. Or people, Mexico City, one worker needs to travel like two hours or two hours and a half daily only to reach his work. If we change this equation, at least for the new cities, you will promote equality. And that people need to take only half an hour at least, at, at most, to reach his place. And that implies more time for his family, more time for more revenues or whatever. 
Thank you very much. Do we have another question or two from the audience? Can you come to the microphone, please? Thank you. Aron Vora with Mini LLC in Bethesda, Maryland. Great cities have great subways, but only about 30 cities in the world have subways. What about making or planning to build subways in other cities in the world so they can also become greater? Well, I agree with that. I love metro. But the point is, uh, according with the research of the commissions and the World Resources Institute mainly, uh, metro subways is, uh, is very efficient, but uh, its cost is very high. So one of the conclusion is, for instance, BRT systems, uh, bus rapid transit system, are more uh, efficient in terms of cost, and uh, I mean per capita benefits. So BRT could be cheaper and very efficient way for a lot of cities. And actually, uh, cities from Colombia or Mexico City are changing to BRT system, and that implies an improvement in terms of uh, massive transportation. Now, depending on the size of the city, it is possible to build new subways, but uh, probably it doesn't fit for anyone or for everyone. Thank you very much. And I had a question here in front, if you'd care to come to the microphone. Um, I am from India. Uh, there is a lot of talk about our Prime Minister uh, trying to build 100 smart cities, not new ones, but the retrofitting the existing cities. Unfortunately, um, big cities, given their complexity and the amount of money required, don't feature high on the list. Do you believe we should focus on the big cities, eight big cities, out of which 80% jobs are created, instead of focusing on 100 cities and not being able to do it uh, in a given time frame? What's your opinion, or should we focus on big cities and trying to fix them first? Like, you know, word is known by big cities of every country, like Shanghai and Beijing. I don't know. Honestly, I think that, uh, of course, any government needs to work in everything. But uh, let me see, where is the graph? Oh, my God. Well, I lo oh, yes. But if you need to pick, I would choose emerging cities, definitely because the projected uh, emissions are going to come from those cities. So the 80%, I would say, should be oriented to the new emerging cities, and the 20% remain probably to fix the current cities. That depending on the budget. Big cities usually have better, uh, better budgets, so they can do whatever they need to do. And you can change and convert even a mega city if you put the right incentives, if you put the right public system for transportation, you can change the density of the city. But if you need to pick, go directly to emerging cities. That's the key issue. That uh, should be my opinion. And remember this, that what uh, Pierre was saying. In 2020, I would say this is the 80, 70, and 60 rule. By 2020, 80% of the economic growth will be in the cities. 70% of the energy will be used in the cities, and 60% of the people will live in the cities. So we need to consider the cities like, key, like a key issue for economic growth, for saving energy system, and of course, for the places in which most of the people will live. Actually, currently, half of the population of the world, we already live in cities. That is the reason why I love, as Andrew, this topic related with urban models and cities. One more, one more question from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for the really inspiring and ambitious vision. I was wondering, I uh, wanted to ask about the levels of government that you see will lead the achievement of this vision. National governments often have a lot of resources but are less accountable to people in cities. Uh, many city leaders are very accountable, and I think they have a vision, but they are, cities are often more, uh, ha have less resources to achieve it. Uh, so if you could elaborate on that. Yeah. Depending on the, I would say, the system in each country. Uh, of course, centralized systems or central systems will depend more on the national government. Uh, uh, federal systems will depend more in the local government. I agree with you, and I do prefer 
that the local decisions are better. Uh, 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 you know the expression is small is beautiful, I would say local is beautiful. But the point is a lot of countries, including Mexico, without the participation of the federal level, it is impossible to address any big issue like urban development. What is important, for instance, is to establish coordinated system, for instance, for transportation and land use in, uh, in several cities. And it is important to get the political willingness of the, any level of government. But in the top of national levels, needs to be a priority strategy related with the new model of, of urban development. Many, many thanks, well, President thank Felipe Calderon, thank for this very, very inspiring vision and your engagement. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much.